doesn't have a seat or if you're a little too crammed, there's plenty of seats in the front few rows, so feel free to come filter in. Um, okay, so we're going to start um, with um, Neil Katz, who's going to be talking about making galaxy formation simulations awesome again. <laughs> All right, thank you. Good to be here. Let's get started. Before I really get going, I just want to mention for those of you live streaming at home, they won't turn the camera around, but the crowd in this room is amazing. <laughs> so, let me move this down. I talk too loud for this mic. So this, this work is being, done, it was being led by my finishing graduate student who is in here, Shui Ao Huang, who is Highly talented and looking for jobs. Keep that in mind, people hiring. So, as you see, I'm going to, if those in the back who can't read this, that says galaxy formation, that says let's look in this closet, and there's a few skeletons there. So, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, we've heard, you've heard lots of talks before this meeting, you've heard lots of talks at meetings by people doing simulations. People do simulations, they match everything. Here's an example of that. Here's uh, maybe the most basic thing, redshift zero, the galaxy's uh, stellar mass function, here's stellar mass, here's the density, uh, the points with error bars, the observations, here's a bunch of different simulations. I haven't remade this plot. I mean, I have illustrious not TNG on there. You can see why they made TNG, because it doesn't go through the data points. Now TNG does. Uh, you see Mufasa on here. You see Eagle on here. Other simulations could do the same. Um, However, when you look at why they're matching everything, it's different in the different simulations. For example, uh, in the Mufasa simulation, there's much wind recycling, right? The, the, the standard idea of galaxy formation these days is that gas goes into galaxies, it goes out, it comes back, it's cycling through the CGM all the time, and how the cycling, how efficiently it cycles and reaccretes determines the galaxy properties, and very basic properties, even like the stellar mass here. Well, in Mufasa, there's lots of, there's tons of recycling, more than probably any other simulation. In Eagle, there's almost no recycling. But yet, they're giving you the same galactic stellar mass function. You might say, let's look at the CGM, where all this is going on. At least basic CGM properties, they give the same predictions for the absorption lines. So, we need to do something a little bit more. Now, when you hear people do talk about simulations, for the last several years, there was all this arguing over my hydro techniques better than your hydro technique. You know, it's going to change your results, and there's all these arguing because they can do very, really intricate test problems and show that you're wrong and I'm right, and then you, you know, you're all right. But that's almost irrelevant because I will show you the Hydro technique compared to the, to the uncertainties in how you're doing your feedback is tiny. How you do your feedback is everything in these simulations. It's not talked about a lot, but that's the way it is. And everybody does it. Everyone's doing supernova feedback. Some people are also doing AGN feedback. The thing they're going to show you today won't have AGN in them, but that's not the point. The point is that everybody's doing the same physics, but everybody's doing it differently and getting different answers from that physics. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. All right, so I'm just going to quickly tell you what I did, what we do. Um, we, we put our winds in by hand. We have these cosmological volumes. We have certain scaling laws and how the mass loading and the velocity go. Basically, velocity goes as the velocity dispersion or the circular velocity, if you want to think about that. And the mass loading has these scalings of sigma to the minus two is small, sigma to the minus one at large. We've changed those over time. We launch these winds probabilistically where stars are forming. And the fire group had this interesting paper emerge of it all where they actually measured their wind speeds outside the galaxies. Right? Anyone who puts their winds in by hand, like a lot of groups do, our repo does that too, um, you put them in where the stars are forming. But of course, wind properties, when you think about wind properties, are what they are outside the galaxy. And we were sort of stunned to learn that here I'm measuring the wind speed at a quarter of the virial radius versus the circular velocity of the halo. And if you just look at this greenish line here, even though we're putting it as V going to sigma, it's almost constant when you get outside the galaxy because it's climbing out of potential wells and it's interacting with gas. So we're not really putting in the winds we really wanted the whole time. But and if you even look down here with a fraction of the winds that actually can make it to that radius, after above about 100 kilometers a second, almost none of the winds even get to a quarter of the real radius. So we were really surprised to learn that was going on in our simulations. We were idiots for not looking at that. Um, but we fixed it now. So this, this blue line now is, 
is what we get when we just tweaked a little bit. We just had to tweak a little bit how that scaling went. Instead of V going to sigma, it goes to sigma to a slightly higher power. And now when it climbs out of the potential, and if you measure things the same way the fire people do, you get this orange line, which is right on their median line, which now we get V going at sigma outside the galaxy, just like fire finds and other analytic models say. But that, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. The, the main point I'm trying to make is, within our own simulation, we just made a very tiny change to the wind model, just in that one scaling. Didn't change anything else. Compared to other simulations where they do the winds completely differently, they might put in some hot particles, they might turn the cooling off. There's all sorts of ways people do this. All I've changed is a very tiny thing in, in this model. And we're going to see how much difference that makes compared to making a change in how the hydrodynamics is being done. And I'm going to show just a couple examples of that. So here, I'm plotting the, the, the galaxy stellar mass function from our simulations. Just for reference, the black line is the observations at redshift zero. Um, so there's three lines plotted in a few of these plots. The, the dotted line is the original stuff like we've published with the broken version of SPH, supposedly, that has terrible hydro and these test problems, which it does. Um, and the original way we launched winds. And then if we just change the hydro technique, you go to the dashed line. That's like a redshift zero, which is red here. So you go from this dotted line to this dashed line. There's a slight change at the high mass end, but otherwise the same. But now you just make that small change to how you're doing in the wind feedback, and you come to this red line here. A huge change. So changing the hydro technique, small change, changing how you're launching the winds in a very small way, big change. Let's look at a more observable for the, for the uh, CGM people in the audience. This is a CGM talk, um, supposedly, in the CGM session. So how do these changes affect measured properties of like absorption lines? Let's, let's concentrate on neon eight here in this panel. So with these, each one of these lines, again, is different changes to the model. The original published work with the old SBH and the old wind launch is this blue line here, not very much neon eight at all, really not agreeing at all with the observations. If you look at the, the green line here, that's, uh, sorry, the red line here, that's when we changed the SPH method. So that, here's a case where it did make a bit of a change, but now you go to this black line where we changed the wind launch, huge changes. You know, now we have things at column densities that are being observed. So again, changing hydro, small change, changing very small change to the, to the wind launch, big change. So what's actually happening? Why is that happening for the neon eight? Just if you're curious. So here I'm plotting a phase diagram, te log temperature, log density. This is the original SPH, the, new, the, the improved hydro, and then the change to the wind launch. And what's being plotted in the contours are where the metals are in the simulation in this space. And the colored points are where the absorption lines are in the simulation with the column density each being shown down here, this color bar. So you can see in the original simulation, there's almost no neon eight. It's all coming down here from sort of IgM-ish kind of material, right? Low density, uh, lowish temperature. But if you look what happens to the metals, the you know, metals all here and here. When you improve the SPH, things do change. You get this, these metals here. These are wind metals. That's due to the fact that you're now resolving the shocks around filaments somewhat better. So that, allow, that means that there's some hot metals here, and those are giving rise to more neon eight absorption, which you're seeing here but they're fairly low columns still. Now, when you change the wind launch just slightly, what happens is the metals that are the hotter metals, sort of like the, the sort of virile temperature metals, extend down to lower temperatures. So you get more metals, this, this goes from here, it extends over to this direction, and that's why you're getting a lot more absorption. But the main takeaway I want you to have is again, small changes to the way you're doing your feedback, big changes, the predictions from the simulations. So you might say, who cares, Neil? You know, you've done these simulations. You, you, you match tons of different observations, galaxy cluster x-rays, CGM, metallicity of galaxies. You know, just you know, declare victory and walk off. I'm not that easy. I mean, there's still, right, we're still need scaling laws to launch our winds. The wind particles are, the, are these individual particles. They can't mix metals. That has issues. Um, and again, things are highly sensitive to your exact subgrid model. If I took someone else's subgrid model and put it in my simulation somehow, I'm sure I wouldn't get the match anymore. So 
You might just ask, why not do it by brute force? The fire people say, I'm just going to do everything by brute force. So, you know, then, then you don't have to worry about all these things. Well, the man sitting in the front row here, this is his simulation, uh, Robertson and Schneider, what they did is they looked at a very basic principle behind all these wind launch models, right? If you just had pure supernova winds, the mass in stars that go supernova is like 1% of the total stellar mass. So you get mass loading factors of 1%. You need mass loading factors of many. So you have to entrain a lot of the gas in the, in the ISM of the galaxy in these winds, get them out of the galaxy. That's the main idea. So let's model that process. Let's have a you know, blob of gas and have hot winds come by and try to get it moving. So they, when you do these simulations, either Brandt's version or Evan Skanapienko, who I work with, is part of this work, you, there's two main results that I take away. One is you need incredibly high resolution for this to result, to this, for this to converge. Right here is three different cases from his simulations. Look at the length scale I'm putting here. These are AUs. These are not parsecs in order to get convergence. The masses are sub-solar mass. They're measured in Jupiter masses, okay? No simulations anywhere near to that resolution. And even the worst news is that the, the blob doesn't get moving. So the basic idea behind the model is sort of, you know, not there. You need to add something, like maybe magnetic fields, or who knows? You have to need to add something for it to work. Um, so first of all, I would say any claims in any simulation that they have the winds arrive naturally are highly dubious at best. Because they're, they're orders and orders of magnitude away from having the correct physics result. Now, you can take those same simulations and turn them around and say, let's say how you did get the coal gas moving. Now it's moving through your hot halo. It's the same simulation, just with a Galilean transformation, right? Now the blob is moving and the, the, the background's stale. So what that tells us, because it didn't decelerate, accelerate before, then they shouldn't decelerate. But of course, in everyone's simulation, those blobs slow down. So that's a big problem. Plus, everyone's resolution, almost everybody's, is worse in the CGM than it is in the galaxy. So whatever problems you had in the galaxy, it's even more, you, if you're off by orders of magnitude before, you're even more orders of magnitude off. So all these interactions between the cold and the hot gas are happening at scales well below anyone can resolve. Now we're in the near future, so you've got to do something. Because remember, the, the way the gas, this is not just to get the CGM right, you know, to match some absorption line that Joe Burchard might tell us about. It's to get the galaxy masses right, because the galaxy is circulating around. So how much gas comes back, how long it takes to come back, which gas comes back, that determines your basic properties, like your galaxy stellar mass, your angular momentum of your galaxies, all these things are being determined by these things, which are completely uncertain in the simulations. But few, there's a way forward, few, um, I'll tell you, what, that's an acronym for our new model that I'm about to tell you about. It stands for Physically Evolved Winds. So what kind of wind model do you want in the simulation, if you could just dream one up somehow? Well, you'd want one limited by your physical assumptions and not by unknown numerics. So all this numerics that's going on that people are, I would argue, people are tuning numerics in that physics in their simulations to match the observations. No one understands that. No one really wants to understand that. So um, I want a model that based on physics, not on unknown numerics. I want it as independent of resolution as possible. I want it to be useful in every different kind of method. People who do AMR codes use a completely different class of feedback than people to do repo, than people to do gizmo, than people to do SPH. So you can't even really compare things very well because they're doing the feedback in completely different ways. The method I'm about to describe can be used in any one of those codes. I want a limited number of free parameters as much as possible. Of course, I want to conserve all the physical quantities that should be conserved. And again, most importantly, I want it to correctly represent the physics as best as we understand it. So the way my idea of doing this is to take a step back. Instead of using brute force, use more subgrid modeling. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but because we're so far away from being able to do it by brute force, this is what I'm advocating. So we're going to launch wind particles. We're not going to let them do their own thing, like in fire, because I would argue doing, letting them do their own thing, they're doing the wrong thing. So you know, you're, you're least, even though you're putting it by hand, you're better off because you know what you're getting. Then these wind particles are evolved analytically using the gas you're traveling through, which hopefully is resolved better by your hydrodynamic code. 
And then eventually, when they look similar enough to the surroundings, then you turn them back into your normal hydro. If it's my SPH code, it's an SPH particle. If it's AMR, you add it back to your AMR grid or your repo cell or whatever you're doing. So what kind of physics are going to affect these particles? Well, you have gravity and ram pressure will affect the motion, the temperature. You have radiative and adiabatic heating and cooling, ram pressure heating, conduction. You lose mass through Kelvin hormones and Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities and through conductive evaporation. So all these are the physics that you need to put in there, a lot of which aren't even in the simulations, even though they don't have the resolution. They still even have, you have all these physics. You can add to those physics. And then what we're doing now is we're assuming that each wind particle is actually a collection of clouds of a given mass that is much smaller than you typically in the mass you can resolve in your simulation. We treat each cloud as a cylinder, and that's because we're tuning them against these high resolution simulations of individual clouds, like the one I showed you from Brent Robertson. I'll show you another one in a minute from my collaborator, Evan Scanapienko. And they look like, you know, they get stretched out. They look like long filaments. So that's why cylinders is a rough, instead of a spherical cloud, we have a cylinder. So, and, um, but it's really complicated. It's why it took me so long to do this. If you look at the simulations, there's these many different phases that show up. You get this semiconductive oblique shock with post shock gas and a contact discontinuity and the cloud stretched out and you get conduction from this post shock material that causes evaporation and the cloud stretched out. There's tons of physics just to make a model to describe what's going on to then put in your cosmological simulation to hopefully make it follow the physics and be independent as you can of the resolution. So that's what we're trying attempting to do inside the simulation. But we're not just making it up on a whole cloth. Again, we're tuning to these high resolution simulations. So here's an example from, from the person I'm working with, Evan Scanapienko. Here's without conduction and here's with conduction. Conduction makes a huge difference. It keeps the cloud from shredding from Kelvin Helmholtz. You only need about 10% Spitzer for this to happen. So if you have 10% Spitzer, if you have full Spitzer, then the cloud breaks up through conductive evaporation in about the same amount of time. But if you have 10% Spitzer, the cloud still doesn't break up through Kelvin Helmholtz, but the conductive time is 10 times longer. The clouds can actually make it way out into the CGM. So that's a way of having that happen. Again, you can, these single cloud simulations, you can ask Brandt, they take a long time to run. There's no way you can have a simulation have a bunch of clouds in them and do a whole galaxy. It's just not possible. And then if you're doing absorption lines, you can take these high resolution things and project them and sort of put them inside in a subgrid way in your calculation where you're doing the absorption lines so you can capture all the structure that will be in this multi-phase gas in these little subclouds. So here's just a point. So we barely got this working. I was hoping it'd be working more before this conference, but it isn't. So here's like the, the stellar mass functions now um, from the new method. The solid line is the, is the new, uh, the dash line now is the, our new SPH, new wind launch, and now that we've moved a little more massive. But this is not tuned in any way. We didn't twiddle any parameters. I don't know how sensitive things are to different things here. An interesting thing now, if you look at the metallicity of accreting gas in the galaxies, in the different phases, you can look here, here's uh, green is recycled wind gas, this is hot mode gas in red, cold mode gas in blue. It's sort of bimodal, hot mode and cold mode, and uh, the wind reaccretion is high, higher metallicity, and then it's about 10 to the minus 3 for the cold mode. The dash lines are what it used to be before we made this change. You can see that now, the metallicity of the pristine gas has gotten up to 10 to the minus 3, which is more in line with observations, I wanted to say. It also affects neon 8 now. You get even more neon 8, much, much more than before. Why? And that's because there's many, many more hot metals here. And now it really is consistent with the observations. Not that I want to make a big deal out of that, but because the metals are now go much further and they can mix with the surrounding gas, you get much more hot metals. So on to my conclusions. Hydro technique, much less important than the feedback. Feedback is everything when you're trying to model these simulations. We do not have and will not have, at least in my lifetime, the ability to brute force these calculations unless quantum computing takes over or something. So you need to do something else. I'm advocating one way of doing it. I'm not saying it's the only way, but it's a way forward out of this conundrum. And that's our physically evolved few wind model. You can tune them to match the very high resolution simulation like Brandt does, and then put those sub -model, those models into your cosmological simulation. Again, at least you can put it into every different type of simulation to make comparisons. 
And these proof of concept simulations look promising, look for more in the next year. If you hire my student, you can do it yourself. Uh, and we're making galaxy formation simulations great again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, questions? Um, yeah, back there. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge expert on the radiation-driven winds. I know if Mark Krumholz was here, he would tell you that that doesn't model doesn't even work whatsoever. So, but I mean, um, but again, for him to study that model, he does incredibly high resolution, again, similar simulations like Brandt does, but with radiation on gas in these really, really high resolution AMR runs, which you would, again, not be able to resolve in any way inside of these, in these simulations. So they, not, I, mean, I mean, I'm doing cosmological ones. Even a galaxy zoom one really has no hope. Um, can I have the next speaker come up? Um, I see Sandy in the back, and I can't, I can't pass. So, Sandy, <laughs> go. Yeah, sorry, I, sorry, I went so fast it was confusing. So, um, the, Sp the Spitzer conduction allows them to survive a long time once they somehow got moving and left the galaxy as they're traveling through like, the CGM gas. The only ways that I know of to get the clouds quote unquote moving are either this one paper with this McCourt paper with magnetic draping. Um, see, in our simulations, I still advocate since you can't model any of those processes, those scales, you should still put the winds in by hand. But if you did want to model how, how in some way you can get them going, the magnetic draping, there's only this one paper, it was a coarse simulation, no one's actually went back to that, for, I don't know why. And the other way is that this, this was mentioned yesterday by Nier or something, this Gronky thing, where the whole cloud dissolves, but then later on, because it has lower entropy, it recools as it goes along. But it's not clear to me a couple of things. First of all, there's no conduction in that calculation. I think conduction might stop that from happening. And secondly, you're still back to the same problem in some sense because you, don't, you might not have enough mass flux because you're still sort of counting on having a lot of the mass flux in the original hot flow when you do that. So it's not clear to me you can end up with enough mass flux in that Gronkian O thing. I mean, it's, it's a T, TBD. On that. So I hope I, I can talk more later, Sandy Duggan. Sorry, there's a lot, I see a lot of hands and we're, we're out of time. So I'm gonna ask people to wait to the discussion, sorry. Um, okay, so your laptop's over there.